Murder is a heinous crime, but it's a heinous crime that piques the interest of a majority of people in the city it is committed. From the renowned Son of Sam to the Midtown Slasher, join me as I explore surprising truths about serial killers who have terrorized the streets of New York City. 1. Lizzie Halliday Lizzie Halliday was born in 1895 in County Antrim, Ireland. At three, Lizzie moved to the United States with her parents. In 1879, she married her first husband, but he died not too long after. In 1881, she ended up with Artemis Brewer, who also died less than a year after their marriage. The recurrent incidents raised a few eyebrows, but no one paid attention till she tied the knot the fourth time. This time, Lizzie married Gerge Smith, a war veteran, but she fled after a failed attempt to kill him by poisoning his tea. In 1888, she showed up in Philadelphia at a saloon owned by the McQuillans, her Ireland friends. Lizzie saw some positive qualities in her friends, which made her set up a shop for herself. But not too long after, she was sentenced to two years at Philadelphia Eastern State Penitentiary for burning down the shop just to get its insurance money. One would think serving a term at a prison helps offenders reflect, but Lizzie proved us wrong. After her release, she became a housekeeper for Paul Halliday, who later became her sixth husband. During their marriage, she burnt down the Halliday family house. It was a painful event, as Lizzie also had Halliday's mentally disabled son locked up in his room with the key in her possession. She didn't stop there. Lizzie burned down Halliday's barn and ran off with his horses. But surprisingly, Halliday also went missing. Halliday's disappearance raised suspicions of the neighbors, which led them to acquire a search warrant. During the search, three bodies were found, two female bodies, which were later identified as Sarah and Margaret McQuillan, and Paul Halliday's mutilated body. Lizzie was arrested and charged with all three homicides. In 1894, Lizzie was sentenced to death by electrocution, making her the first woman to be given that verdict. The governor of New York reduced her sentence to life in a mental institution after a medical arrested institution declared her mentally ill. Lizzie later died in 1918. Two, Aron Key Aron Key was a serial killer and a rapist who had a morbid obsession with engaging in forced sodomy with teenage girls who lived in various housing complexes located across Harlem. In 1991, he murdered his very first victim, Paula Illera, who was 13. Johalis Castro, 19, and Rashida Washington, 18, were also victims of Key's sexual assaults and deaths by strangling. Castro's body could only be identified by a bracelet worn on the ankle because Key had charred it beyond recognition. DNA testing was done on Rashida Washington's body in January 1999 by the New York Police Department. The DNA result found was also associated with two other Manhattan rape victims in 1995 and 1996, giving off the identity of the culprit, 25-year-old Aaron Key. The New York Police Department then offered $11,000 for his arrest. Key, now a wanted man, kidnapped 15-year-old Angelique Stalling from her Brooklyn flat and flew her to Miami, Florida, starting an East Coast search. Key and Stalling stayed at various Miami hotels in the weeks that followed. On February 19, 1999, Miami cops raided his hotel room. Stalling was rescued and flown to New York. Key was flown back to New York and charged with the murder of Rashida Washington, kidnapping and falsely imprisoning Stalling and the rape cases of 1995 and 1996. After further analysis, Key's DNA was also linked to the deaths of Paula Illera and Johalis Castro, and another rape case in 1992. After being placed under arrest, Key displayed great rage in front of the judge, during which he asserted that he was the victim of a huge plot involving the switching of DNA. In 2001, he was sentenced to three life terms for the murders and an additional 20 years for the rapes after being convicted due to the extensive DNA evidence and the testimony of the rape victims he had left alive. Later on, while Key was incarcerated, he created rape cards that were 25 and 7 inches in size and illustrated handwritten reports of his crimes, as well as the things he had said to his victims, such as, say, I love it, be quiet and take it like a woman, and act like you love me. 3. Mary Beth Tinning Mary Beth Tinning, a Schenectady, New York resident, was charged with committing many child homicides despite being described as a devoted mother. These children were her own, unlike many other cases of child killing. Between 1975 and 1985, Tinning had nine children, four boys and five girls. Eight were her biological children and one was adopted. Most of these children died within a few months of birth. None lived to see their fifth birthday. Tinning frequently visited the ERs of the local hospitals in Schenectady. She frightenedly brought her ailing kids there, saying they had stopped breathing. Hospitals consistently claimed that sudden infant death syndrome, or SIDS, was the cause of death. Still, no one ever questioned the statistical impossibility that nine infants in one family might have perished from SIDS. 
the inquiry revealed that Tinning's primary motivation for carrying out these homicides was to draw sympathy and attention to herself. Tinning was found to have experienced an emotional high following the loss of each child due to the attention given to her. Tinning's third child, Jennifer, died of meningitis only a few days after her birth. Her demise came about naturally. Jennifer Tinning was the family's first child to pass away, and it seems that her death sparked some evil in Mary Beth, causing her to murder her children one after the other. However, the death of Tammy exposed her. While investigating Mary Beth, she claimed to have discovered three-month-old Tammy Lynn comatose in her cot, with blood spilling from her mouth while visiting the hospital with her ninth child. After being arrested, Tinning eventually admitted to the crime and said she had also been gradually poisoning her spouse. Although there was strong circumstantial evidence for the killing of eight children, Tinning was only charged with the murder of Tammy Lynn. She was found guilty and is currently serving her sentence in prison, but has repeatedly been denied parole because she continues to show no sign of remorse. 4. Julio Gonzalez On March 25, 1990, Julio Gonzalez went to the Happy Land Club in the Bronx, where his ex-girlfriend Lydia Feliciano worked as a coat check lady. Lydia and Gonzalez had just ended their relationship recently. When he came to see Lydia, he had gotten himself drunk. As expected, the brief meeting escalated into a dispute, which led to him being kicked out of the club by the bouncers. What came next was different from what anyone would have anticipated. Still furious, Julio tried to buy a gun, but was unsuccessful. He then walked over to East Tremont and Crotona Parkway to purchase gasoline. On the way there, Gonzalez found an empty Black Hawk hydraulic jack oil container. Inside the gas station, the attendant, a 23-year-old Lehman College freshman named Edward Porras, initially refused to give him gasoline, but changed his mind when another man came along and told him Gonzalez was all right. Gonzalez brought it back to Happy Land, doused the entire structure, including the steps, and set it ablaze. Then, Gonzalez walked across the street and watched as the fire began to spread. Unfortunately for the people inside the club, the place had several violations, including a lack of fire exits, alarms, or sprinkler systems, which only worsened the situation. Furthermore, to prevent individuals from entering for free, the venue had sealed all doors except the primary entrance. In a moment of panic, some people broke a door open, helping others escape. A total of 87 individuals perished in the fire outbreak. Lydia, the target of Gonzalez's ire, did not die in the fire. She was smart enough to recognize what was happening and immediately left the club. She warned the others, but claimed no one listened. After being done watching, Gonzalez took a bus back to his home and began to think over what he had done, resulting in him crying the entire way back. The following day, the police found him still asleep in his apartment. He was arrested, charged, and sentenced to 25 years imprisonment. However, in 2016, while serving his jail, he suffered a heart attack, leading to his death. 5. Juanetta Hoyt According to an investigation, Juanetta Hoyt was a good mother who had repeatedly been dealt with unfortunate circumstances. Juanetta gave birth to five children between 1965 and 1971, but all died. Most people thought the babies had been killed due to a condition known as Sudden Infant Death Syndrome or SIDS. No one ever thought they could have been murdered. Dr. Linda Norton, a forensic pathologist from Dallas, Texas, developed an interest in the Hoyt case. After reading Dr. Steinschneider's report on the Hoyt case, Norton became suspicious and began to look into the matter. This pushed her to reach out to a prosecutor in a nearby county. When the prosecutor was elevated to the position of district attorney in 1992, he looked further into the case and sent it to another forensic pathologist, Michael Barden, for examination. As Baden looked into the case, he unraveled a secret. The Hoyt kids had been murdered. In 1994, a couple of years after Barden's shocking discovery, the case's prosecution was handed over to the county's district attorney, where the Hoyts had lived at the time of the alleged crime. A few months later, Juanetta Hoyt was approached by a New York State trooper who happened to be an old friend. He requested her assistance with his research on SIDS and she obliged. However, this was a trap as the trooper, alongside two other police officers, began questioning her about her kid's death. After an intense questioning session, she admitted to killing all five children by suffocating them. Juanetta tried to justify her actions, saying she killed the babies because they were wailing and she wished to put an end to it. After a court trial in 1995, she was given a verdict of 75 years, 15 years for each murder. In August 1998, while serving her term, Hoyt died from pancreatic disease before her appeal. This led to her being formally exonerated under the New York law. 6. Martha Beck Martha Beck was brought up in Florida under harsh conditions. 
She had an abusive mother and was constantly bullied at school due to her weight. Beck was left with no choice but to run away from home. Years later, Beck finished school and became a certified nurse. However, her weight prevented her from getting a job in the health sector. Beck later relocated to California, where she worked as a nurse in a United States Army hospital. While in California, Beck got pregnant out of wedlock. To avoid embarrassment, she returned to Florida with claims that her child's father was killed during the Pacific Campaign. Shortly after her daughter was born, she married Alfred Beck. They had a son, but got divorced six months after marriage. Beck, now a single mother of two small children, decided to put up a Lonely Hearts ad, to which Raymond Fernandez responded. Fernandez, born December 17, 1914, was married in Spain and had four children, some of whom he abandoned. He served in the British intelligence in World War II and then sought a job in America. During this period, he had an accident where he fractured his skull and suffered a lesion to his frontal lobe. The damage was suspected to tilt from his sense of right to criminal exploits. His first crime was stealing, and upon imprisonment, he met a cellmate who taught him voodoo and black magic. Fernandez couldn't afford to put his power to waste, so he began duping ladies of their possessions after feasting with them. It was in this period he met Martha Beck. Blinded by her obsession with being accepted by a man, Beck traveled to New York to live with Fernandez, leaving her two kids behind in Florida. Fernandez, moved by her act of unconditional love, confessed his crimes to her. Beck was calm and willing to join her lover in all his endeavors. One of their victims, Janet Fay, a 66-year-old woman, got engaged to Fernandez and moved in with him. Beck found Fay in bed with Fernandez and, in a rage, hit her with a hammer. Fernandez finished it up by strangling her to death. Out of fear, Beck and Fernandez moved to Byron Center Road in Wyoming Township, Michigan. There, they moved in with one Delphine Downing and her two-year-old daughter. One day, Downing was nervous, so Fernandez gave her sleeping pills to calm her. Her daughter was troubled seeing her in that state, and she began to cry. Seeing this, fear gripped Beck, and she strangled the little girl but didn't kill her. Fernandez thought Downing would be suspicious of her bruised daughter, so he shot her. After spending a few days at Downing's, her daughter cried again, but Beck drowned her in a water basin this time. When the Downings weren't seen, suspicious neighbors alerted the police, and on March 1, 1949, Beck and Fernandez were arrested. Both were ultimately apprehended and put to death in the electric chair in New York in March 1951. 7. Richard Kuklinski Richard Kuklinski was born in Jersey City on April 11, 1935, to a violent alcoholic father and a strict religious mother. He was abused physically and verbally by both of his parents throughout his childhood. The torture his father meted out was so severe that it resulted in the death of Kuklinski's older brother, who, according to the story presented to the authorities, had tumbled down the stairs. He dropped out of school in the eighth grade. Kuklinski then decided to pass his aggression on to the rest of the world. At 10, Richard started torturing animals and fantasized about killing his father. He was known to tie cats together by their tails, throw them over clothing lines, and watch them tear each other apart. At 14, he committed his first known murder, beating Charlie Chase, the leader of a teenage gang, to death, throwing him off a bridge and removing his teeth and fingertips to prevent identification. He then attacked the six other gang members, almost killing all of them. As an adult, he ventured into robbery and marketing of pirate coffee. Surprisingly, he got married and had his kids, but despite this, he murdered five people in cold blood between 1980 and 1984. When his family was questioned about Kuklinski, they claimed not to know about his criminal activities. During investigations, it was discovered he froze one of his victims to hide the time of death. This incident gave him the title Iceman. Furthermore, they found his modus operandi was to lure men to secret meetings with assurances of abundant business opportunities, then kill and steal their money. After an 18-month-long investigation in 1986, he was arrested, and in 1988, he was sentenced to life confinement. Still serving his term, he admitted to killing a police officer, Peter Calabro, in 2003. This confession earned him an additional 30-year sentence. After his murder convictions, Kuklinski granted interviews to writers, prosecutors, criminologists, and psychiatrists. He claimed to have brutally killed 100-200 men, though the murders are unconfirmed. Kuklinski said he was previously a mafia hitman and claimed to have killed Jimmy Hoffa, the International Brotherhood of Teamsters president from 1957 to 1971. After over 16 years in prison, Kuklinski was diagnosed with Kawasaki disease, an inflammation to blood vessels, in October 2005. He was transferred to St. Francis Medical Center in Trenton, New Jersey, for treatment. Kuklinski died on March 5, 2006, aged 70. 8. Richard Angelo Richard Angelo ought to have been counted among the decent ones. Angelo, 
an emergency medical technician at Good Samaritan Hospital on Long Island, New York, had previously achieved the rank of Eagle Scout and served as a volunteer firefighter. He was described as a man who was sincerely concerned about the welfare of others. However, this could not be further from the truth. Angelo, a nurse, started creating emergencies at the Good Samaritan Hospital since he didn't feel recognized. He would inject the patients with pavulon and anectine to cause paralysis, numbness, and an eventual cardiac arrest with hopes that he would be the one to save them. At first, Angelo successfully used this tactic, gaining the credit he desired from his fellow employees and the patients he had saved. However, individuals observed a trend of emergencies occurring during Angelo's shift, which led to the staff becoming suspicious of him. One day, one of the patients noticed that Angelo was injecting him with something, and they managed to touch their call button which alerted the nursing staff to the patient's predicament. After reviewing the substance Angelo was trying to administer, he was discovered. In later investigations, Angelo admitted saving only 37 patients, of which only 25 of them were able to survive the ordeal. The authorities also found identical substances that caused paralysis at Angelo's residence. When questioned about the murders, Angelo explained that he didn't mean to kill them. I wanted to create a circumstance in which I would cause the patient to have some respiratory distress or some other problem, and through my intervention or suggested intervention or whatever, come out looking like I understood what I was doing. I had no confidence in myself. I felt very inadequate. Angelo was found guilty and given a judgment of 61 years in prison for his crime. Even to this day, he is still there. 9. Joel Rifkin Rifkin was raised in a relatively ordinary environment. He was subjected to severe bullying in school, where he had a low academic performance due to his learning impairments. Around this time, he started experiencing dreams about committing violent acts against women. Later on, after he had finished school, he tried to get work but was unsuccessful. At some point, he began to seek the services of prostitutes, while simultaneously developing an interest in serial killers who murdered prostitutes. He went so far as to gather newspaper clippings on serial killers who murdered prostitutes. On February 20th, 1989, Rifkin committed his first murder when he killed Heidi Balch in the home he shared with her in East Meadow. He then dismembered her body by extracting her teeth and fingertips, putting her head in a paint can and leaving it in the woods on a golf field in Hopewell, New Jersey. Her legs were disposed of further north, and her surviving torso and arms were dumped into the East River around New York City. The head of Balch, which had been removed from the body, was found on the seventh hole of the golf course on March 5, 1989. The identification of her remains did not take place until 2013. In 1993, Rifkin was arrested after the police on the Southern State Parkway stopped him for driving without a license plate and observed a rotten odor coming from the trunk of the car. After checking, they discovered the decomposing remains of Rifkin's most recent victim, a prostitute and dancer, Tiffany Bresciani. After investigations, it was discovered that Tiffany and Balch weren't his only victim. It was assumed that he killed 16 more women in four years. Rifkin claimed most of the victims were prostitutes, but after killing them, he would dissect his victims and place their parts in a container which he then tossed into various water bodies across New York. In 1994, he was convicted of nine second-degree murders and sentenced to 203 years in prison. 10. Albert Hamilton Fish Albert Hamilton Fish, known as the Werewolf of Wisteria, was an American serial killer in the early 20th century. Born in Washington, D.C., Fish had a rough upbringing and was sent to an orphanage after his father's death. His experiences there, which included severe physical torture, contributed to his eventual criminal behavior. In his later years, Fish committed horrendous crimes. His targets were often vulnerable young boys and girls from disadvantaged families. Fish would lure his victims to remote locations before torturing and killing them. He also claimed to have eaten the flesh of his victims. In 1928, Fish kidnapped and killed eight-year-old Beatrice Keel. After he killed her, he sent a letter to her parents. Also, in 1934, Fish murdered Grace Budd. He had lied about applying for a job and met Grace's family. He took the girl to an abandoned house and killed her. However, similar to his modus operandi, he had sent a letter to Grace's family. In the letter, Fish confessed to the murder and described the torment he inflicted before killing her. This letter, which had no house address or postal number, was tracked due to a unique embossment that belonged to a papermaking factory, and this had given Fish's location away. William King, a prosecutor, investigated the murder case for years and gathered a lot of evidence against Fish, including his confession letter and witnesses who saw him near the murder. This led to Fish's arrest and trial for the murder and kidnap of Grace Budd. Although he was a suspect in at least five murders, 
He admitted to having murdered only three and stabbed two others. On January 16, 1936, Fish pleaded guilty and was executed by electrocution in Sing Sing Jail, New York, Albert Hamilton. Fish's acts outraged the nation. He was a frightening figure in American criminal history due to his extended evasion of arrest and his immense depravity. His death offered his victims' families closure, but it did little to alleviate their suffering. 11. Robert Shulman American serial killer Robert Shulman terrorized the city of New York in the early 1990s. Shulman, born in 1954, had a difficult upbringing and a history of mental illness. He was given medication to treat his symptoms after being diagnosed with schizophrenia. However, his mental illness did not stop him from becoming one of the most terrifying. Serial killers who carried out a slew of vicious killings. Paula Hernandez, a college student of 19 years old, was Shulman's first victim in 1991, marking the inception of Shulman's murders. He killed at least three more young, defenseless women the following day. Before attacking and killing his victims, Shulman would pursue them and stalk them for days or weeks. The murders Shulman committed were exceptionally graphic. He frequently cut his victims' corpses with a knife after strangling them with their garments. Additionally, he would take out their eyes and save them as souvenirs, which he would then use to mock the police. When Shulman was arrested for a different offense in 1996, his reign of terror ended. He confessed to the murders and offered information only the perpetrator would know when questioned. He was then accused of four charges of murder and was subsequently convicted on each count. Shulman was given a life sentence without the chance of release. He did not live long enough to complete his sentence, though. He hanged himself with a bedsheet in his prison cell and was discovered dead there in 2006. 12. David Berkowitz, son of Sam, American serial killer David Berkowitz, sometimes called the Son of Sam, was a murderer who terrorized New York City. Berkowitz, who was born in 1953, had a troubled childhood. A few days after his birth, his mother gave him out for unknown reasons. He was later adopted by Pearl and Nathan Berkowitz, who raised him like their own. In the mid-1970s, Berkowitz committed his first crimes. He had been responsible for the murder of two young ladies, and he had injured a third. Over the following year, he continued killing several other people, primarily young couples out on dates. Berkowitz frequently approached his victims in their cars and shot them with a 44 caliber handgun at close range. The authorities started an extensive search to try and apprehend the son of Sam, after his killings spread panic and anxiety throughout the city. The excitement surrounding the case was only heightened by Berkowitz's insulting letters to the police and the media. In 1977, when a patrol officer observed that Berkowitz's car matched the description of one that had been seen leaving the scene of one of the murders, Berkowitz was finally apprehended. Berkowitz admitted to the killings when the police approached the automobile and he was eventually arrested. During interrogation, Berkowitz stated that his neighbor's dog was one of the reasons he became a murderer, claiming that the dog demanded the blood of young women. He claimed that Sam referred to his former neighbor Sam Carr, and that Harvey, which was Carr's black Labrador, was possessed by an ancient demon that issued irresistible commands for Berkowitz to murder people. Berkowitz was given six consecutive life sentences in jail after being found guilty of six counts of murder. Despite his slew of heinous crimes, he had developed somewhat of a cult following among true crime fans. In recent years, Berkowitz has admitted his wrongdoing and converted to Christianity. He claims that reading Psalm 34, 6 from a Bible that a fellow prisoner gave him, finally led to his conversion. He also said from now on he should be referred to as the Son of Hope rather than the Son of Sam. He now actively promotes mental health awareness and emphasizes the value of seeking care for individuals experiencing mental illness. 13. Joseph Christopher Midtown Slasher American serial murderer Joseph Christopher worked in New York and other states in the middle of the 1980s. Christopher was born in 1955 in Buffalo, New York to Nicholas and Therese Christopher. Joseph learned to shoot and use a gun from Nicholas, an outdoorsman and hunter. According to friends, Christopher's passion for the outdoors outweighed all his other hobbies. In 1978, Christopher, who had paranoid schizophrenia, sought help after detecting a decline in his mental state. In September 1980, he attempted to admit himself to the Buffalo Psychiatric Center. He was informed by the staff at the psychiatric center that he could not be accepted because he posed no risk to himself or others. .22 caliber killings began 14 days after he departed the center. Christopher's slaughtering journey started in 1980 when he killed a man in Buffalo, New York. The following years saw him kill several victims in New York and other states. Christopher's victims were black men and he would frequently follow them for days or weeks before killing them. Christopher used exceptionally violent murder techniques. 
he frequently used a .22 caliber pistol to repeatedly shoot his victims, after which he would sever their bodies with a knife. On November 13, 1980, Christopher enlisted in the US Army and was transported to Fort Benning, Georgia. After a while, he took a Christmas vacation to Manhattan, New York. There, Christopher killed four people and stabbed two others within a time frame of 12 hours. He then returned to Buffalo, where he stabbed two other black men. Christopher couldn't get a hold of himself as he stabbed three more people, but they all survived. In 1981, Christopher returned to Fort Benning. There he was arrested after stabbing a black Fort Benning soldier. While in detention, Christopher had a couple of psychiatrist sessions where he admitted he had to kill blacks. This admission led to further investigations. Christopher was ultimately connected to all his crimes and was convicted on all counts. Christopher was originally sentenced to 60 years imprisonment, but his sentence was later increased to life imprisonment without parole. He died due to a rare form of breast cancer while in prison. 14. Kendall Francois, American serial murderer Kendall Francois, was active in Poughkeepsie, New York, in the late 1990s. Francois, born in 1971, had a difficult upbringing and a history of mental illness. He was eventually given a paranoid schizophrenia diagnosis and spent some time in a mental hospital. However, this did not stop him from carrying out a slew of vicious killings. In 1996, Katina Newmaster, a 29-year-old woman, became the first victim of Francoise's crimes when she was murdered. Over the following few years, he continued to murder at least seven more women. All of Francoise's victims were prostitutes, and he frequently enticed them to his house before killing them. Particularly horrific murder techniques were used by Francois. He frequently used their garments to strangle his victims, after which he would store their bodies in his house. The bodies of some of his victims were reportedly kept in his attic for months before being disposed of. The authorities were called to Francois's residence in 1998 on account of a foul odor coming from the house, and there they learned of Francois's crimes. When they arrived, they found numerous bodies assumed to be of Francois's victims. As a result, Francois was detained and faced multiple murder charges. Francois was found guilty on all accounts and was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. In 2014, he passed away in prison from natural causes. The consequences of Kendall Francois's crimes continue to affect the Poughkeepsie neighborhood. Many people felt scared and uneasy because of his horrible murder techniques and targeting of ladies. The fact that he was apprehended and found guilty, however, also bears witness to the diligence and commitment of the law enforcement personnel who toiled non-stop to bring him to justice. While some may have felt relieved by his passing, his acts nonetheless traumatized many people. The legacy of Francois serves as a reminder of the value of mental health care in our society and the world as a whole.